it is the pink elephant theory. If the guest wants a pink elephant, get them a pink elephant. If you can't find a pink elephant, get a horse, paint it pink, convince the guest that's an elephant. Do whatever it takes to ensure they're happy. That's it. Are they happy? We are back. Chris Adams here with you. It is the Pink Elephant Podcast. Today, we have Mr. Jim Bishop with us. Jim, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Of course. And you know, you have um, Conjunction Leadership is, is your brand. But I'd love to give, if you can give everyone just a snapshot of, of kind of what is Conjunction Leadership, and then we'll dive into really the past and how, how you got to this point. Absolutely. I'd love to. Our, our purpose in the world is to make sure that leaders do less reacting and more leading. Um, what I like to say is that they're looking out their windshield more than their rearview mirror. And why? What does that matter? Well, downstream, it creates a culture where we can build better humans through the work that we do. So my belief is that we spend a lot of time in our workplaces um, and those workplaces should help us be more effective in our overall life. They should help us lead, um, not just where we're at in our vocation, but also when we go home at night, lead our families, lead the community groups that we're a part of, lead our churches or our synagogues, make sure that we're also leading in our PTO clubs and maybe even local governments. But all too often what I see is that many people get burned out from their day job and they go home at night and sit on their couch, eat too much, watch too much TV and scroll too much Instagram, just trying to escape and re-energize for the next day. And so my belief has always been that a leader who gets more comfortable with who they are and becoming a better human themselves first can be in their more creative space and self-author the things they want to see in the world. And when we do that, we step into a place of wholeness and richness that makes our cultures and our organizations just lead with a lot more freedom and joy. And you said a lot in a short amount of time, and I'm, I'm here taking notes um, as you're talking, and there's some things that jumped out at me, and, and I'm going to start kind of diving into them before we even go back to how you got here, because it was just too good for me to let it go. But you talked about uh, reactionary, and I think about the, the industry that our company deals with is, um, for the most part, is hospitality. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a world where it is a constant state of reaction. I mean, from we look at P&Ls the 10th of next month from last month, and then we start talking about what went wrong where we're already halfway through the next month. I mean, it's a constant state of reaction, re reacting to, right? We look at Yelp reviews and all these things that that's post. It, it's we're reacting to issues that are going on. Um, so I absolutely love the fact that you're talking about the fact, how do we, how do we transition from being reactionary to looking forward and making sure that we're making progress versus constantly dealing with something that's happened in the past. I mean, how, how did you get to that of, of realizing that was such a huge uh, pressure point in regards to leadership? Yeah, I've, I've been a part of many different industries. Um, for 20 some plus years, I worked in corporate America, many different roles and backgrounds, but eventually leadership, leadership development, organizational development, organizational design, and executive coaching kind of were the, the main spaces. Um, but that gave me privy to sitting there and seeing a lot of leaders. And some leaders would burn out, some would flame out, and others would come in and lead with joy and freedom. Really sitting back and looking at what is the success factor in between there, one of my, one of my early um, beliefs was if I could just give everybody the gift of, a, of desiring reflective time and that that would make a big difference at least that was my belief because the leaders that seem to get ahead and seem to be the disruptors of their industry or the disruptors of the, the status quo were those that were more reflective and pensive and a little bit more um, they, they would they would make small adjustments over time um, the leaders that would flame out are these high achiever mentality, maybe high extrovert type of personalities that just want to get a lot of stuff done, but they're constantly looking at the data and reacting. And it's almost like a ping pong ball caught too tightly. It just keeps bouncing back and forth and back and forth. They just couldn't catch a breath to get ahead. Right. And so that was where a lot of the belief got started. It's been founded and grown and nurtured and cultivated through this executive coaching experience where time and time again, what we do is we do just give the leaders the gift of that period of reflection where they can pause, catch their breath, reflect on who they are as a person and what do they want to see in the world and what will get them closer to that and less away from 
just reacting to what they think everything else around them should be like. So, yeah, that's it's such good advice. And I mean, look, as uh, as human beings, we I always say we typically for most people, our emotions dictate our behavior, which means we're very reactive in the state of um, and it's tough. I mean, it's it's not like, I'll be honest, I talk about it. It's not like I've mastered it, right? I think as a human being, stuff happens and your immediate response to it, it's like, I sometimes do very good at stopping and and saying, let me take a minute. And then sometimes I'm, I do very poor at uh, immediately reacting based on an emotional response. But you talked about better people. And it's, I, I love that you said that because just recently, um, I was having a conversation with some people and talking about this specifically and realizing like for my own business, how much my business catapulted, I, we were doing very good as a company. We now do unbelievably great as a company. And I believe a huge part of that is when you start to figure out how to get your personal and your professional um, to find a little bit of alignment there. And that means becoming a better person and making sure that personally is reflecting on the professional. And so it's, I love the fact that you talk about that at how, as we become better people and you, you don't, a lot of times let those two things, they, they live mutually exclusive when the reality is they're, they're very much overlapped. And as you start to find, um, the, the space you're supposed to be in personally, you start to see professional, professionally things start to thrive. So I, I love that you speak about that. Yeah, it's much more classic in the entrepreneurial sense, right? When your actions do result in the, the, the shorter term downstream consequences of your income and your, your investment that you're making, you can directly see that all growth is necessarily first personal growth, right? Um, yeah. And what you're learning in your business automatically reflects upon you as a person. So you're, you're drawing the connection there in a larger, more maybe large scale corporate type of setting that that is not always the case. And when I say that my purpose is to help leaders become better humans so that they can create cultures that are better human centric, a lot of corporate leaders will scratch their head and be like, I don't need any of that soft fuzzy stuff. Just give us the results. Right. Um, yeah. And in reality is, it's still the same there too. All growth is necessarily personal growth. And if we just were to look at what happened pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, the employee value proposition completely changed. And what employees expect, especially in those large corporate settings sometimes is, I, I want to become a better human because of the work that I do here. I need to be that. I want to be more connected to a reason and a purpose. And I also want to be connected to the people around me. I don't want to just come in and earn a paycheck and wait for the gold watch at the end of the journey. And I, I literally took the notes that I took are almost like what you just said that talked about, because when you talked about burnout and we talk about post pandemic and what this, the, I don't want to say the next generation, but what our, what our teams are really looking for. And when you talk about our industry and hospitality, immediately people try to say, because our industry lost a ton of people and they said, well, they left in droves because of pay. And the reality is that's not the case. And now we have enough data to support the fact that, of course, everyone wants to make more money. Let's not act like that's never a factor of anything. But if we really look at the data, it says that our teams want to have a purpose. They want to they want to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And um, I, I like to use the term it, when we find people that allow their passion and their purpose to intersect that's when you start to find uh, your place. That's when you start to find excitement in what you do every day. And I think too many times, thanks to social media and a world that we live in, we have a lot of people that start pursuing uh, other people's purposes because of their passion. I yeah. see, man, I see what you put on social media and I see the life you're living. I see your excitement. So I want to do that. I want to do what you do. And we're allowing someone else's passion cause us to pursue their purpose. And I think for me, that all relates back when we look at our organizations and, and what we do as consultants working with large corporations, the term culture, which is used so much nowadays. And I think it's overused because I don't think people really understand. And I say organizations do a phenomenal job at creating culture right now. I always say when you go to start your first business, you're sitting there and I always I say, man, you go back and look at that BevNap 
at a bar where you wrote, this is the new company I'm launching and oh my God, I'm going to launch an LLC and you write down what your mission statement is and what your pillars are and your core values. And you do such a great job of creating culture. And then on day one of all these companies, we have orientations where we talk about, this is who we are. This is our culture. This is what we believe. I said, we do great at creating. We struggle at cultivating. And I want to know that on day 361, you're still living what you told me you were on day one when you sold me in on this proposition of joining your organization. And everything that you're talking about for me is it's culture and culture is it's in your DNA. It's, it's how we live it day in and day out. Would, is that a fair assessment of, of, of your logic on that as well? Yeah, I mean, my my opinion of it is every every organization has a culture, and they do relatively well at culturing it. They have growing it. They just haven't necessarily taken it into the purposeful part of the culture. Now, mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, if you're a highly reactive leader and you're constantly looking at the last data report to determine your next action, you're looking at your rear mirror to determine how we're going to move forward. Guess what? You're, you're going to create a culture that is highly reactive and you don't yeah. know that you just think that I'm leading that you, you may not even be um, 100 percent certain that that's the way you're leading. But what happens is everybody sees what happens with the leader and they assume that that's what it means to get ahead. So they will react similarly to the leader. Every organization has a culture. Right. Sure. I love I love Seth Godin's um, definition of it. People like us doing things like this. So what happens is. The leader generally surrounds themselves with people like us, people like them, and they do things like this, and we normalize that. So over time, that normalization happens in the culture. What, what I think I hear you saying is the purposeful part of the culture, the intentional part of cultivating it and making sure the tension of where we're at and where we want to be, we're continuing to grow more in the direction of the future rather than the direction of the past, right? Um, I get a lot of calls from well-meaning HR leaders or people who have said, hey, I'm owning the culture project and we need some help. And I politely listen, but most of the time what they're really asking is we need to come back in and re-clarify our mission, vision, values, and we're going to put it on a brass plaque and we're going to hang it by the door so that everybody knows who we are and what we do. We'll put it on our orientation programs and our napkins and everything in the cafeteria. And in reality, as I tell them, that that's not really going to work because people will end up walking past it, seeing the audio, not meeting the visual, right? Where we have to start is with the heart of the leader and say, okay, if you espouse that these are the things you want to see in your culture, let's do a deeper dive on how they're showing up in your life or not, right? And if we're able to help create that within the leader who is actually responsible for the culture, not just the person owning the project, what will happen is the footprint around the leader starts to change because people like us do things like this. If a leader has a belief, as an example, that we want to be very humble or we want to be very transparent, right? But they also have a belief that people can't be trusted. Then what's going to happen is they're not going to be transparent and they're not going to be vulnerable and they're not going to be humble with other people. So those words that they say and the actions that they show aren't there. It's really only in the safe spot of coaching where they're going to admit that, yeah, I do have a belief that I can't trust people and therefore I don't delegate or share any information with them that I, that, that I don't trust them with. When they admit that, then we can start pivoting and disrupting and growing into a different area. But if they don't admit that and they don't admit that to at least the person that, that they trust, then they're not going to change and the culture's not going to change. Right. So, yeah. Which really comes back to what we were talking about earlier is, are you becoming a better person? Yeah. And by becoming a better person, it directly relates to that culture that you are living, that everyone sees the actions are mirroring the words. So it's, yeah. it's, it's great stuff. So, all right, then I, I got through those points because you just brought us some good stuff. So now let's, yeah. let's go backwards. How did we get to this point of, you know, I don't think anyone wakes up and at 22 years old, you, you go, you know what? I'm going to jump in and be this phenomenal leader and launch this company and do everything you're doing now. So how did you get here and what was that process? Yeah, at, at age 22, I didn't have a clue about this. So <laughs> yeah. um, I, I we'll just start at the origin story. I'm classically trained as a scientist. So I went to school, got a degree in reproductive physiology, thought I would go out and do genetic consulting, uh, went, went out with the customers was there to represent the product, answer any technical questions they might have. And what happened was they were asking me all questions about their employees. 
How do we hire them? How do we retain them? How do we incentivize them? And I knew nothing about that. At least I, I didn't feel like I academically knew anything about that. But what I had to reflect upon was in my college and even in my youth experience, I had been part of a lot of leadership activities. I had been part of organizations and teams for a very long time. And it was in college that that really got sparked, different leadership roles and different functions. And I developed a large network of like-minded people there. So what I was able to do for my clients was bring in some of these resources that would help. And I naturally started learning. This is why I was in those organizations, because I love that stuff. I love watching teams function better. I love watching leaders get different results. I, I'm a natural disruptor, so I love watching industries or niches get disrupted. And when all that started to happen, I just realized I can pivot my career a little bit. I didn't really enjoy the science. It was the easy thing. You know, it was empirical. You could study it. You could figure it out. But people, people were really a mystery. So we, I started doing instructional design. Um, I started doing some training work. I started to do a lot of facilitation. I ended up in a couple roles where we were in leadership development, doing classroom experiences. Then I mentioned executive development, succession planning, talent management, some associated HR functions. And it was really in the midst of um, a lot of corporate restructure where budgets were getting cut, people were getting cut, and we realized putting butts in seats in classroom experiences really wasn't changing our culture, but giving people a curated experience where they could get comfortable with their human-centricness and who they were as a person started to shift those gears. So I got my executive coaching certification, started going as a, mostly as an internal coach with a few external pro bono clients along the way, and then 2020 hit, and the world was in upside-down chaos. Um, people were in disruption all over the place, plus the hyperpolarization that was going on in most of our cultures. I realized there had to be a different way. And again, reflecting upon those 20 some plus years of watching leaders, I could see those that were making big strides were those that were comfortable with themselves, but they could also naturally hold the tension. They could hold the tension between two competing things. It wasn't Republican or Democrat. It was middle, middle of the aisle type of ideas. Um, it wasn't either this or that. And so thus the name conjunction was born because those are the leaders who were able to put the and in between rather than the or come up with new options. The most of a lot of my clients internally decided to also with the great resignation start moving externally. And so there was a conflict of interest with a lot of them and there was enough business there with a lot of conviction and a little and, a, and even a greater dose of courage, I decided it was time to bring this out in a commercial sense rather than leaving it inside and uh, under somebody else's corporate umbrella. And um, conjunction leadership was born. So the journey of entrepreneurship has been about well, I'd say it's been 27 years in the making, but it's been about four in the marketplace. So. Wow. Do you see, um, you know, as we look at this, the I keep saying the next generation of, of talent that we have working in, you know, really pick, pick your industry. It really doesn't matter. Um, and technology, AI, all these things are starting to factor in um, into how we're seeing organizations mm -hmm. run themselves um, and, and their labor models. And how what do you think the next evolution of leadership is? I, I think if you you look at leadership in general, there's some foundational principles that are always going to be there. But what do you think's next? What, what's the, the next thing we're going to see transpire that's really going to energize people and, and get them excited? Yeah, I mean, we're already starting to see a, a pretty big shift. And if you want to call it like B class um, organizations or uh, those that are that are purpose centric, but also serve the development of human need. Right. And when you intersect with those, there's a lot of challenges because you know shareholders today in a class A type of organization don't they don't necessarily appreciate some of that softer stuff that may not appear to be as ROI driven. Mm -hmm. um, yet these these organizations are starting to separate themselves from that and say there has to be a reason that we exist that's greater than just turning a profit. Because sometimes the downside of just turning a profit is we might be harming the environment, we might be harming other humans. When we put that whole person paradigm around it, that means we have to have whole person people who lead it. And the, the business schools of today are not necessarily teaching that. 
the leaders who are being groomed and you know that are leading organizations today that were being groomed in their roles in the last 20 years weren't necessarily being modeled that it takes natural disruptors and people who who just have this churning or this misalignment in their soul to say there has to be a reason that this place exists and it's bigger than just the money that we generate now money is important it's what generates the the the, the cycle but it can't harm other things and so the mental shift that's gone on is we have leaders who understand how to run and lead complex organizations. Complex organizations, for lack of a better term, would be like um, a, a car engine with its many components, but each one has an assembly manual, manual. And when you put it together, a mechanic can figure out how these components fit together. But it's it's process oriented, it's streamlined, it's contained, and it's figure outable, if you will. The organizations of tomorrow and the culture that we live in is much more complex. And that complex culture is one that is, runs much more like an ecosystem. So if you were to think like a pond, you know, the sunlight coming into the pond determines how many plants can grow and those plants determine what type of animals are there. But if we don't, if we get any of those variables out of balance, then what happens is the ecosystem starts to suffer. A leader of tomorrow has to be much more like a manager or a leader of an ecosystem where they understand the, the yin and the yang of the balance. They don't, they don't, they can't anticipate it, but they have to be able to respond to it. We've got a little bit more sunlight, so we need to tone down on the plants. We need to bring up the animals. And those are, those are a sensing and responding type of competency. A leader of a, compl a complicated system what they do is they're just able, they're, they're really good at planning, organizing, controlling, and strategizing. But those things are the competencies of the past, adapting and sensing and responding, coaching and catalyzing. Those are the competencies of the future. That's great. I love, I wrote down ecosystem leadership. I think that's a, that's a great model, to, a, a way to think about it. And it's, I'll be honest, it's a little, it's scary to look at as I look at the industry that we're focused on and the leaders that we see in these positions are getting younger and younger. And they're, they're individuals that when, when I worked on property at a hotel, they, they were lead servers. Now they're food and beverage directors over the entire hotel. And which is great. We're seeing younger and younger people get opportunities, but with that means that there might not be as much of this, that, that seasoning, the maturity that's attached to it, and not maturity with age as much as maturity of what you're talking about is really understanding the leadership aspect of I'm not just checking boxes, going down a list of things to make sure it gets done today, but how am I managing the operation? How am I looking at the ecosystem of how this operation is, is going from a day-to-day -day basis? And how am I overseeing that and making all those pieces work together? And I, I think we're at a space right now of figuring out how do we help inject more understanding around that leadership piece, the importance of it, because the reality is we have owners that own, own our properties that are, are way more, they're not traditional hoteliers, they're Wall Street, it's, it's real estate groups. So they're looking at a spreadsheet saying, I need more money. We have guests that have higher expectations than they ever had before. We have our labor models that have less people attached to it than we had in the past. That formula doesn't really work together very well to get great results, which means we have to find a way to really hone in this leadership piece. So this next generation, our new leaders really understand their role and how to get the most out of themselves and those that are working um, at, at our hotels. And I, I just absolutely love this ecosystem leadership as a way to help them understand it in describing it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a man. I'll be honest in in full transparency. It is a tough time um, on our side of helping manage all these different levels of understanding the the ask from ownership, the demands from ownership, um, understanding that especially post COVID, the demands and asks from what our guests are are looking and expecting, um, and the fact that our labor models aren't what they used to be. And it's not a matter of we can't find people. Like it's it's not oh well we we're trying to hire but we can't. It's literally we've we've slashed our labor model. That says oh we need fifty percent less people to do that job. And we're like well. Expect high, expectations are higher than ever before from our guests and we have less people to do it. It's a, it's a tough ask. Um, and I believe wholeheartedly 
that leadership is the is the core of how we're going to find a way to make this work. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a tough situation. Similar, similar to many other industries where profit or profit uh, maximization drives most of the decision making, right? But the downstream yeah. consequence that you're saying is what's what's the what's the human element that we're negating here, right? And yeah. yes, ROI is what we're striving for in business, and yes turning a, a, a profitable cash cycle is always important, but not at the expense of what might be downstream collateral that we're not anticipating or not, not able to see because we're so laser focused on only one variable of success, right? So I guess it, it comes back to a little bit of the do no harm mentality. Like we sure. want to do good, but we don't want to do any harm at the same time, just because we're doing good. The, the amount of good doesn't offset some of these, the negative things that may be going on. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. There's so, I mean, at my, for me, there's, there's a line for some of this stuff. And, you know, if you look at a P and L and I look at, I'll use food cost, food cost can only get so low. Like there, there comes a point where you like, you have max, like there is no other way to get, to make it better outside of saying, we're just going to keep jacking up the price um, of what we're charging our guests. Well, there's an effect that, that comes from, from doing that. And so um, it's an interesting time. To, to say the least of how do we try and maximize dollars uh, for our owners? Cause I get it. Everybody needs to find ways to make more money, but there's, there's also a limit to how much we can continue to, to push in some of these areas. When we're talking about leadership, who have been some of those leaders over the years that, um, that have impacted you? And some of these individuals, obviously um, you have personal mentors and people that have been in your life that have, that have helped kind of sh shape you. But on a on a bigger scale, is there anyone out there, any authors that, man, they have really helped me over the years and, and given me insight? You know, I think of myself, the John Maxwells of the world and, and whatnot that are just, they, they've been staples for me along my journey. Who would it be for you that that just stick out as people that you've, you've looked to? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there's... The definition of leader to me is anybody who's influencing somebody to take a different action, right? So there are leaders, great and small, but uh, John Maxwell, you know, Ken Blanchard, those folks that that have founded their life on the study and the the impact of how other people lead and have put it into words that other people can understand. Those are certainly important. Um, I, I do read a lot. I love Adam Grant. I love social psychology. I love those types of things. Like what makes people tick. Um, those yeah. types of leaders are ones that I certainly give a lot of time to. Um, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and things like that, like Hidden Brain might be an example of one where we're just, I'm just always trying to be intrigued by what's the other side of the story that we're missing out on. Or um, So there, there, particularly there's a book that, that influenced me quite a bit and it's, it's called, um, um, let me think of the name of it real quick. It, uh, Oh, mistakes were made, but not by me. Um, Carol Travis is the author, and it really speaks into the, the 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 theory of cognitive dissonance. That that feeling that I see myself as a morally upstanding and good person generally, and everybody else must be wrong. I mean, that's kind of the theme <laughs> of the book. But example after example after example of how our brains trick ourselves into thinking that we don't the way we see the world is upright and just and good and everybody else must be wrong and we we overlook some of the mistakes that we're making the reason that that book influenced me so much was because it is the thing that kind of gets in the way of a lot of people's leadership it's the thing that they have a hard time stepping away or stepping to the balcony if you will and looking at themselves as if they were a neutral person observing someone else their cognitive distortion sometimes is that I am a morally and upstanding right person doing the best that I possibly know how. And therefore it clouds me from saying I did anything wrong. And therefore leaders can march into battle or slash budgets or do whatever. And now because of my congruence, I feel like I have to continue going down this path to stay congruent with who I am and what decisions I made, even if what's coming out doesn't appear to be what I intended. 
it's very difficult for a leader to step back and say, wait a minute here, we better sense and respond in a different direction, right? So examples in the book from you know, wars that, that leaders have started to decisions that company presidents have made to even personal interactions between family members and divorce situations or whatever. But we, we can start off just with a one degree of difference, but because I said this and you said that, we eventually move further and further apart to stay congruent with our own selves, my own cognitive distortion of myself, and not appear to want to step across and learn about someone else. And I, I just fundamentally believe it's one of those things that affects us as human beings and our society at large even more today than it ever has. So. I am ordering the book the minute we are done. I'm a big reader myself, and so anytime my my dad was a psychologist, so. Um, I am very much, and our brain was built on understanding really uh, human behavior and how we react to things and everything you're talking about, man, it is, it's so dead on and, and true. And it is so difficult um, when you feel that as a human, that for all intents and purposes, you're a good person and you have the best of intentions in your decision-making. Um, it's really difficult I think a lot of times to be able to step back and view um, yourself personally from above versus being in the midst of it. And, and so that is a, I love that mistakes were, in, were made, but not by me. Yep. Gonna... Elliot, Elliot Spitzer and Carol Travis, Tavis, I think her name, their names are two co-authors. So. That's, that's, I look forward to, to diving into it. Maybe we'll do another one of these where you and I could just talk about that book specifically. Yeah. <laughs> and the impact that it has. It, it will make you doubt your brain. Um, it will make you realize just how many times your brain has played tricks on you. So, uh, what do you think is next for for uh, conjunction leadership? As you, I have to imagine that what you established and, and what you thought, at least this is what it's been for me, what I thought my company was going to be 10, 15 years ago to what it continues to evolve. And yes, the foundation of who we are has never changed, but the company continues to change and evolve based on everything that's happening. What do you think is, is next for conjunction leadership? Yeah, great question. Well, we, we spend, I spend the bulk of my day um, in one-on-one -on -one conversations with leaders. And those one-on-one -on -one conversations change to insights that change behaviors and ultimately change some of their results. When they get different results, then we spill over to the team and we bring the team along with them. And so what's really becoming more and more now is the team development piece of it. We've got a lot of leaders who are courageously embracing some of the changes um, and some of the more you know, volatile situations in our environment and solving really, really difficult problems that really need to get solved for for us as humans to move forward. But now their teams need to come along with them. And beyond the team, then there's a new way of relating, right? So as businesses grow and businesses structure, they tend to want to add hierarchy and organization to make sure that the system runs more efficiently. Um, sometimes hierarchy and systems gets in the way of our desire to be more human and relatable in our, in our work. And so I think the next evolution of this is where I start finding myself getting involved is a lot more around how should we be interrelating in our organization rather than how should we be organizing. Um, you know, the big four consulting organizations will come in and help put together org charts. Those org charts are meant to put names in boxes and headcount so that we can get an understanding of the ROI. What they're not always helping the organization do is talk about how do we relate to one another and get decisions made so that we don't have to rely upon the power of the hierarchy to escalate the decisions and then de-escalate them back down the chain and get them executed. That system is taking way too long for organizations to respond in today's environment when stuff is changing so quickly. So we just need to be more to more like a colony of ants, if you will, that harmoniously work together and go to the source of the problem and just figure things out without deference to title or position or hierarchical challenge while we still add, have some process and controls in our businesses that make sure that we have checks and balances. But we don't need six layers of management to make sure that the system runs effectively. So I sure. find myself dabbling more and more in that space. Makes sense. Are you seeing that with, you know, post pandemic or, or really during the pandemic, how we've transitioned to virtual, 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 no one needs to go to an office anymore. Are you seeing your business? Obviously we do a lot virtually and, and with teams and zoom and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, are, have you seen any bounce back to, hey, we need you here. We need you in our space, face-to-face um, versus doing um, the, the virtual sessions? Uh, I've seen I've seen various responses to that, triggered out of two, what I believe are two different reasons. Okay? The first response, triggered out of a threat response, primarily in the senior leadership capacity, that I don't want to re-innovate how I lead, and it's easier for me to make sure that you're all here and I can have the presence effect to know what's going on, says one or two or maybe the executive committee of people. It's generally driven out of a fear of we're losing control or we're losing our culture, right? It is much, much more difficult to make sure that people like us do things like this in the remote environment because we're not even sure we're like one another and we're not even sure what we're doing. So a lot of times in the virtual environment, I only know Chris from the shoulders up. I don't really know Chris's heart or his being or who he is as an individual. And so in that environment, the first the, the first response is a leader gets threatened because they see our culture slipping and they want everybody back. So yes, I have seen that. The second response is where the employee base kind of rises up and says, gosh, we just don't know each other very well anymore. We don't have a reason to, to talk about stuff. Like before in the cooler, the water cooler or the lunchroom, we were at least interrelating. And sometimes we went to lunch together and sometimes we did social stuff together. That doesn't happen in our dispersed work environments today. When the employees come forward and say there is a reason for meeting, I feel like that's a much more organic way of regathering and rejoining. And it takes advantage of our desire to connect as a human. On the other side of it, it comes across as a power trip where a, a threatened leader or a threatened leadership team pulls everybody back. And now you've got hostage participants rather than willing engaged participants. So you just you just have to look at the what is the response you want to try and get. And generally, the moral of the story here is the more freedom and autonomy you can give employees, the better off they're going to be. And so freedom and autonomy to allow them to regather is going to gain their commitment to the cause rather than force their will to relent. Interesting. So do you think the more, uh, from an organization standpoint, the more freedom and autonomy we give them, in theory, that means you're going to you're gonna actually build trust, which means they're going to be more committed to the cause. Are there situations, which there's always going to be circumstance this happens where the opposite effect happened, right? Where you get somebody that's like, man, I got freedom. I'm doing whatever I want. I'm, I'm living my own life and, you know, taking advantage of the situation. Those, those situations are going to happen. What do you feel is the best way for a company that's dealing with, Hey, we're, we're buying into this. We're giving more freedom. We're going to, we're, we're letting go of the reins a little bit because we, we believe in you. We trust you and believe this is the right thing to do. And you've got one of those individuals that is, is taking advantage of that's going the opposite direction. What's the best way to deal with that? So the rest of your team sees it in a positive way versus uh, fear of, oh my God, they're, they're dropping the hammer on someone um, and they're, they're not really giving us the freedom that they said they were. Yeah. Well, let's just take us back to our elementary days, right? The, 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 the uh, analogy that comes to the back of my mind is when, when one of your classmates got caught chewing gum and it got stuck in the carpet and the teacher said no more gum in the classroom, how did everybody else respond, right? Not real favorably because we created a policy for the exception instead of dealing with the exception, right? And so in today's world, managerial courage is more needed than ever. That's a, that's a huge competency that's, that's not there in many cases. Um, courageous authenticity is a competency that's needed more than ever in our leadership, and it's usually not present. When, when I am triggered out of a response to put a policy in place, it gives me the neutrality to say I can hide behind the policy because this happened, because this person cheated on an expense report, because what this, then now we have a policy. Um, leading by policy is generally contrary to helping people feel connected in the workplace, right? They don't understand the reason why. But when what happens is if one person steps out of bounds or does something that is deviating the agreements that we put in place, we need to deal with the one person with courageous authenticity. Now. 
depending on the severity of the infraction, I can be soft on the person and hard on the problem and still be very, very clear and kind to the individual. But generally what we wanna just be is nice to everybody and say, well, guess what? Here's the policy, someone violated it, now everybody's in trouble and we're gonna raise your spending limit. You, you used to be able to spend $1,000, now you can only spend $50 a person until I have to approve it. Now we put that policy in place and we put someone to administer the policy and someone to review all that stuff. We've just added three layers of bureaucracy and overhead to the organization that we never needed to have because we didn't have a leader who knew how to handle a situation with courageous authenticity. So beautiful, beautifully said. And we uh, courageous authenticity is we uh, there's a great book. I don't know if you read it uh, by Kim Scott, Radical Candor. And it, it's, yeah, it's one of those ones that we've pushed to our team to say, this is how our organ we need to live by radical candor. It's kind of that same mentality of, you know, always speak, but speak with truth and love um, and making sure that we're open and honest and all, and all those things. So I, I love that. And it makes so much sense. And I think sometimes for those that are listening or potentially watching right now, the fact that you, the way you communicated that and the way you talked about it. Um, I think makes a whole lot more sense than someone that's potentially trying to figure out what to do in this situation and trying to like, hey, you know, we need to have a process. We have to have a policy. We have to do this. And then again, it makes sense that, well, yes, we should have a policy and people need to follow it. But the way that you just laid that out um, and understanding the other side of the spectrum of it, I think was is beautifully done. And it's one of those things that people need to pay attention to. It's usually more difficult for um, the, the piece of the puzzle that's most of the time missing when we gather in groups is that we haven't we haven't spent enough time in what I would call our chartering exercises. And that would include things like setting our common ground rules or our common expectations. Right. So it's easy for us to say we want to be we have our values and honesty, integrity and respect. But what we haven't said is we are people who do not lie. Right. If you're part of this group, you are a person who does not lie. Um, you are a person who does not cheat. You are a person who does not whatever. And we are, we set those common agreements with one another and then we form mutual accountabilities over them. What generally will happen is when we have better, clear agreements with one another up front, we can then be more courageous in our authenticity of holding each other accountable for them later on. But because we didn't set clear agreements when we charter new teams or put people together in an organization, a lot of times the leader's sitting there thinking, well, I have nothing to fall back on. I don't even know, is this my opinion or is this everyone's opinion? And those small things along the way, when maybe we saw someone cheating or lying early in the process before they cheated on an expense report, we, we just didn't step in and handle those. And so it got conflated to the point where now the, the error is so egregious that we've got to deal with it in a public sense, right? So. In my estimation, what we do, why I think the future of the work is getting more and more there is leaders are getting more courageous and they're stepping into a place of all these messy edges and helping people relate better. And the teams are generally starting to come behind them. And what, we're, what we see naturally happening is the restriction of some of those policies to allow the freedom and the networking to occur. We, we see some of the stripping out of the layers of management. And yet there are still a few leaders in the system who are very threatened because that goes against every ounce of what they've learned in leadership is to optimize control and plan the death out of the business, right? Breathe the human element away so that we can control these variables like we used to in TQM days. And in today's world, that's not going to work. And when that leader is threatened because we de dysregulated the system, if you will, then what they want to know is, well, how are we going to control this? How are we going to manage by the exception? How are we going to put the policies in place? And then they just add all the tax back into the system that we've stripped out. When in reality is clear agreements and courageous authenticity are going to go a long way at helping us interrelate differently and hold each other accountable without all of the restriction and taxes that we pay in policies. Yeah. And, and to piggyback on that, I think you, and you said this, it's making sure we don't let those, those minor situations that are occurring boil in and, and and turn into major problems that we're having to deal with down the road because we didn't deal with a very minor situation that turned into a major problem later. Um, and man, I have to tell you, I can't thank you enough for joining us. People, people need you, Jim. Like you're, this is the information that you're, 
that you're presenting. And a lot of times it's information that like a lot of people will go, yeah, I knew that. But the way that you are laying it out, the way that you're um, verbalizing it makes it so easy to digest. Um, and I think taking it, digesting it and figuring a way that how we're going to implement it. Um, so you were you were a jewel. You were an asset to um, our leadership communities for sure. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you and find out find out more about what you're doing and then potentially say, hey, our company needs you. We need more of what you're saying. How what's the best way to get in touch with with uh, you and, and your organization? Yeah, I, the, the place that I'm most active is on LinkedIn. Um, uh, social media, is a, it, you know, we have Facebook and Instagram and those places too. But if you really want to get up to date on the content, what we're doing, uh, LinkedIn is there. There's a tab right at the top, book a call. You can just click on that button and we'll schedule time to, to sit and visit. Um, that's, that's the most efficient and the simplest way because I keep that most up to date. We do have a website, all the podcasts that we've been on and the, the articles that we've written, they're up there as well, conjunctionleadership.com. Um, you can go there, find a way to also book a call and get involved. So either of those two are primarily the best way. And if all that fails, just shoot me an email at jim at conjunctionleadership.com. So. Man, I can't thank you enough. I, I know that those that are listening can't thank me enough for having you on this uh, to hear what you have to say. And I tell you, a lot of what you're saying, yeah, I, I, I get the, the luxury of being able to do this with individuals like yourself. But man, a lot of what you're saying speaks to me as well, right? And I, I am a student every day and trying to be better and learning. And a lot of the past 45 minutes has honestly been been great for me as well and things that we need to make sure that we are doing for our organization. I can't thank you enough for being a part of it today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it so much. Of course, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. You've been listening to Chris Adams on the Pink Elephant Podcast. You could obviously find us on our website, ellisadamsgroup.com, myself, through social media at chrisadams.official. Please hit subscribe. Let us know that you're you're tuning in and, and uh, give us some feedback and let us know how we can be even better for you. Thanks and we'll see you next week.